as the bearer party carry the coffin through the west door of St George's Chapel. The choir of the chapel will sing Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills.
choir will now sing the Russian Kontakian of the Departed, an ancient Kiev chant with its origins in the Russian Orthodox Church. It was sung at Prince Philip's funeral by just four members of the choir standing in the nave of a near empty chapel during the pandemic. This time the whole choir will sing.
The Dean of Windsor, the Right Reverend David Connor, will give the bidding. We have come together to commit into the hands of God the soul of his servant, Queen Elizabeth. Here in St. George's Chapel, where she so often worshipped, we are bound to call to mind someone whose uncomplicated yet profound Christian faith bore so much fruit. Fruit in a life of unstinting service to the nation, the Commonwealth, and the wider world, but also, and especially to be remembered in this place, in kindness, concern, and reassuring care for her family and friends and neighbors. In the midst of our rapidly changing and frequently troubled world, her calm and dignified presence has given us confidence to face the future as she did with courage and with hope. As with grateful hearts, we reflect on these and all the many other ways in which her long life has been a blessing to us. We pray that God will give us grace to honor her memory by following her example, and that with our sister Elizabeth at the last, we shall know the joys of life eternal. The first hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded.
The reading by the Dean of Windsor is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The prayers will be led by the minister of Crathy Kirk near Balmoral, the chaplain of the Chapel Royal, Windsor Great Park, and first by the rector of Sandringham. Remember, O Lord, thy servant Elizabeth, who has gone before us with the sign of faith, and now rests in sleep. According to thy promises, grant unto her and to all who repose in Christ refreshment, light, and peace through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Merciful Father and Lord of all life, we praise thee that thou hast made us in thine image and that we reflect thy truth and light. We give special thanks for the life of thy daughter Elizabeth, for the mercy she received from thee and for the example that through her life of service, love and faith, she has set before our eyes. Above all, we rejoice at thy gracious promise to all thy servants, living and departed, that we shall rise again at the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray that in due time we may share with our sister that clearer vision when we shall see thy face in the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Father of all, we pray to thee for those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them peace, let light perpetual shine upon them, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purposes of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life, until the shades lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in thy mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Amen. Lord God Almighty, King of creation, bless our King and all members of the royal family. May godliness be their guidance, may sanctity be their strength, may peace on earth be the fruit of their labours, and their joy in heaven thine eternal gift, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God save our gracious Sovereign and all the companions living and departed of the most honourable and noble order of the Garter. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The choir of St George's Chapel sing the motet, Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven. The words of the poet John Donne.
there is now a solemn ceremony in which the orb, the scepter and the crown are each taken from the coffin. The scepter is the monarch's symbol of earthly power. In Shakespeare's words, it shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the fear and dread of kings. The sovereign's orb symbolizes godly power, a cross above a globe representing Christ's dominion over the earth. the imperial state crown. The emblems of majesty placed on the altar as they were taken from an altar at her coronation 70 years ago. Thus is a sovereign's power symbolically relinquished and passed to her successor. The second hymn, Christ is made the sure foundation.
there is now one final ceremony. The regimental lieutenant colonel commanding the Grenadier Guards hands the Queen's Company camp colour to the King. He will place it on his mother's coffin. Then the Lord Chamberlain, the most senior officer of the royal household, breaks his wand of office in two and places that also onto the coffin, the symbolic end of his service to Queen Elizabeth. And as the Dean says Psalm 103, the coffin is very slowly, almost imperceptibly, lowered into the vault beneath the chapel floor. Like as a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto them that fear him. For he knoweth whereof we are made, he remembereth that we are but dust, the days of man are but as grass, for he flourisheth as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goeth over it, it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endureth for ever and ever upon them that fear him, and his righteousness upon children's children. Go forth upon thy journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who strengtheneth thee, in communion with the blessed saints, and aided by angels and archangels, and all the armies of the heavenly host. May thy portion this day be in peace and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. The Garter King of Arms proclaims the styles and titles of Queen Elizabeth II. Thus it hath pleased Almighty God to take out of this transitory life unto his divine mercy the late, most high, most mighty, and most excellent monarch, Elizabeth II. By the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, and Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. As at the Abbey this morning, the piper turns and walks slowly out of the chapel. To those still inside, his lament fades to silence.
Let us humbly beseech Almighty God to bless with long life, health and honour and all worldly happiness the Most High, Most Mighty and Most Excellent Monarch, our Sovereign Lord, Charles III, now, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, and Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
Jamie, you were mentioning earlier this very much a family occasion for the young Prince of Wales and his wife and children. Absolutely. I mean, I'd love to just sort of highlight how marvellously well Prince George and Princess Charlotte have, have done today. They started school, a new school, six or seven days ago. And I just think they've been faultless. Even after a service of such beauty and a day of such majesty, it may still be hard for many to accept that this really is the end of such a remarkable chapter in our national life. Perhaps very hard for members of the family to accept too, and some solace perhaps in the knowledge that Her Late Majesty is profoundly sustained by her faith. Canon Lucy Winkett has been watching the committal service with us and in those last moments, even those words of reassurance and tenderness from the clergy matter, but it is a profound moment that people can feel bereft, but within the heart of the Christian faith is the deepest blessing. I thought the service was dignified and sombre and simple, actually. We didn't have trumpet fanfares at this service. It was, it was immensely personal and dignified. But as the orb and scepter and crown were removed from the coffin, they were placed on the altar. The next time we will see those is at the altar at Westminster Abbey when they're given to the new king. And we were told at the end that the fever of life is over, the busy world is hushed and the queen's work is done. But then in the blessing, all of us were encouraged to be of good courage and hold fast to that which is good. And so it, it really was, a, I suppose, a hinge moment at the end of, of what must have been an exhausting day for everybody taking part, um, but a very peaceful end to, to, a, to a busy day. It was that moment to recall the new king's address, a promise with destiny kept it had a stillness to it at its heart. I think that this, this service was a, it was clearly committal following the funeral service, but it was, it did have that element of simplicity about it and, and the family very much at the heart of it, yes. Hugo, I think one of the people, think, one of the things people won't forget not that it was a surprise, but just the deep, deep sorrow in the new king's eyes as they were singing God Save the King there at the end. This is true, the reminder that there's a new reign and um, that really we've come to the end of a long journey and the finality of seeing the coffin descending slowly into the vault you know, after we followed it all these last days through its magnificent progress through Scotland and England and in a way back home I like to think, because Windsor was such a special place for the Queen. You see here members of the family leaving. You saw a moment ago, um, that's our attendant lovers, you saw a moment ago the Duke of Kent. Could I just remind you that he actually walked in the King's funeral procession 70 years ago when he was 16 years old. Jamie, as we just look at these pictures and are reminded of the, the children who've witnessed this service, of course, most notably Prince George and Princess Charlotte, there's the work of parents on display here to explain, to nurture, to guide, to encourage, to support on a day like this. There is. I think, um, I think that Prince and Princess of Wales have obviously, um, obviously, see their, their their family as the absolute sort of central pillar of their 
of their existence, and quite right to and, and the way that they have brought Prince George and Prince Louis and Prince Charlotte up has, has really been... <laughs> <laughs> That's a little girl who's yes. been on best behaviour and just needs a bit of breathing out. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, but in short, they realise how, how important family, family is, actually, as, as part of their you know, duty as parents. Lady Sarah Chateau there in the centre of the shot, Hugo. And the Earl of Snowden, who is probably better known to us as David Lindley. Lady Sarah, very close to the Queen. Always, the Queen took a great interest in her, very kind to her, particularly after losing her mother, Princess Margaret, really, 20 years ago, at a much younger age. You see, there's a there are many things that may have taken people by surprise today, may have taken all of us in here by surprise, certainly took me by surprise, but that moment when the crown and the Auburn scepter were removed from Her Majesty's coffin and put on the altar, that's a truly we come with nothing, we leave with nothing moment. I mean, I, you must have been expecting it, but the power of it was extraordinary. And I think it's the, the physicality of a funeral and a committal service is, is really important that the coffin is there and people, we, we have to face it and then we have to face it not being there. And it, it, the fact that the coffin disappears from view, however that happens, is incredibly, is incredibly important for the, the kind of realisation and the acceptance of everyone who's watching. And we've said many times, you know, the Queen said she had to be seen to be believed, but you know, Death also has to be seen to be believed, and we live in a society where actually we, we, death is hidden. I mean, it very often happens in a in a hospital in a very private environment. But uh, I think this particular uh, set of ceremonies has allowed us to witness de to death, to the death of this particular special person, but also to bring us into. Uh, close proximity with our own mortality. And the Russian Kentuckian for the Dead, which was sung at that service, absolutely uh, faces us with that. You know, we are dust and to dust we shall return. And it's something that is it's absolutely something that will happen to all of us, but we spend nearly all of our lives pretending that it won't. That perhaps partly is the, the you know, there are many things in the power of today, you, you know, right? I mean, there's the love of the Queen, pure and simple, the joy she gave to people, but there's people we've lost, imitations of our own mortality. Jamie, I mean, I think one of the memories that I'll actually stick with, that there are many today, but one of them was just the family walking away that you were just talking about. And Lucy was just saying that moment for a family, you know, you've been grieving, but when the coffin comes in, you see the coffin, you know it's going for the final time. That's immensely tough. So I'm, I guess the point is we shouldn't underestimate the impact on the family of this. This has been a very tough day and in public. That's right. However, the other side of this is, is the example that the, the Queen has set for generations to come, including the younger generation of the royal family or the youngest generation of the royal family. And in that way, it may seem that Prince George and Prince, Princess Charlotte were very young to be in attendance today. But in a way, it's an affirmation of, of, of how the Queen has lived her life, that they should be witnessing um, this sort of closing of a chapter. But as we said before, the sort of comet trail of what the Queen leaves behind is really invested in them. And it was, I think, wonderful and appropriate that they were there today, because it just transcends the generations. It's a beautiful image, the comet tale, that will stretch all the way to the family chapel later this evening, Hugo. We know that she has been reunited in death with her beloved Prince Philip. And later this evening, behind all closed doors, away from public gaze, laid to rest in the family chapel here at St George's. Yes, well, up to this point, I mean, we've been allowed to share the grief um, and the experiences, the magnificence, the processions, 
the wonderful music and the wonderful words that we've heard. And the next part is private, and quite right that it should be. Um, 1968, after quite a long series of discussions over what they, how, would, how would they bury King George VI, he was very special, he'd had a very difficult reign, and he loved St George's Chapel and he loved the Order of the Garter. And then eventually, at one point, they decided they were going to have a, perhaps a, a sculpture by Epstein on a, coffee, on, a, on a tomb or Henry Moore, but the Queen Mother thought no. And they've decided to build this little chapel, which is just off the North Choir Isle in a buttress between the Rutland Chantry. And I remember it being built between 1968 and 1969. Actually, I was even lucky enough to attend the dedication service, which was rather memorable. And the king, who'd been in the royal vault since 1952, was brought up and laid to rest in that chapel. And then in 2002, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, her coffin was placed there, and the ashes of Princess Margaret, who had died a few months, a couple of months before. So tonight, what will happen is that the coffins of Prince Philip and the Queen will be brought up from the royal vault and placed in that chapel, and there will be another, I imagine, very short service of blessing. And what they've chosen, okay, they've got a little chapel, not everybody has a little chapel, but they aren't having effigies. We won't see that. The, the, the two will be very like the marble slab under which Henry VIII and Charles I are buried in the centre of, centre of the Isle of the Choir of St George's Chapel. So I think it's rather special and it's also very modest. Jamie, we've all been observers to today. You've obviously been a participant, you've been in the Abbey, you've talked very movingly about the young Waleses and what William and Catherine may have said to Prince George and Prince Charlotte. What's your abide, what will be your abiding memory of today, though? I mean, there's a snapshot that I remember right at the beginning of the service, and it was actually um, two Victoria crosses and a George cross um, entering the Abbey to take their seats. And you can see them standing. here on, on the screen. Four Victoria crosses, what am I talking about? Look at that. That's quite a, quite a sight. But what, what struck me with that was the, was that instantaneous sort of link between people who have given supreme service and in, in terms of valour and gallantry, but also that there's that indissoluble bridge that occurred to me, that they were honouring somebody who had also given supreme service uh, in a different way, but in a no lesser way in some ways. In some ways, it rounds the picture off that you've got the US Commander-in-Chief walking right behind them in Absolutely. that. Absolutely. There have been so many moments, haven't there, that will be captured and thought over and reflected on in the coming hours and days. Cameron and Lucy, what, what stands out for you? There have been moments of deep spirituality that have spoken to the heart of the late Queen's faith. I think that's right. I think it's... For, for, for me, it, as with many funerals, it's, it is the physicality of it. So the arrival of the coffin, when people see that for the first time in the service, and also when it, when it goes. And there's this, there's this you know, proper realisation that she is gone and that uh, we, move, we move, we take a step, we take a step forward now with, in this case, a new king, obviously, um, but that there is a there's a there's a moment where uh, we realise what we've lost at the same time as accepting you know a new a new future and that those two those two things go together very closely. So for me, it's it's I guess the beginning and the end of the of the day. I'll go back to that that point about hope as well. The thing I, I take away from all of this ten days is is what Her Late Majesty has has done to bring us all together. Uh, and I mean, whether that's internationally or whether within this country, you know, we're facing very, very difficult times and we've got difficult times ahead. And almost her last great gift to us was to bring us all together to celebrate her life. She was far too modest for me to, she wouldn't have liked me to put it like that way. But I think that's, that's a real gift. And I, I feel, I feel much more hopeful than I did before. I know we've got hard times to come, but I think she's given us that. That's part of that comet trail. Do you think, I mean, perhaps I can ask you, Hugo, perhaps I can ask you, do you think in the end, the kind of final reflection on this chapter is it's, she's just a powerful testament to the quality of character? Does it, does it come down to being as simple as that? You know, she 
her devotion to duty, the sincerity, the quality of her character that we all got to know. It, the message we've been getting, of course, in the last few days is this extraordinary selflessness, constancy, all the way through. And I've always thought of another thing, which I think is important about the Queen, that I, I know that her sort of declared philosophy was, you know, do your best every day and say your prayers at night, which is very nice and simple. But also, I think she really wanted to do a good job for her father, King George VI. And, you know, that being an afterlife, if they meet them, meet somewhere else, that he will be able to look her straight in the eyes and say, you did a really good job for me, and she'll know she has. Don't you think? That's a lovely thought. Well, let's hope they are having that conversation right now. I think the um, I think I'd just add to that um, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, too, because what, we're, what we saw with King George VI and, and Queen Elizabeth yes. was this marvelous, marvelous pairing, very like Her Late Majesty and, and Prince Philip, and in a way, remembering my days many years ago when I was Queen Mother's equerry, just the closeness of their two ma their two late Majesties um, was something to behold, and, and you could see it as a continuum. I also, I was just thinking, I was thinking about the Archbishop's sermon, actually, because obviously we focused on the character of the Queen, exactly as what you were saying, and her faith. But I think, I think the Archbishop took, took the opportunity to take his cue from the Queen and say that's what leadership can look like. And the, the people that were gathered in the Abbey was an extraordinary audience, which very few people get to address in that way, in that very direct way. And I think he did throw down a challenge, really, and say, this is what leadership can look like, service in life, hope in death, was his phrase. And he also, uh, without saying anything particular, but also threw out a challenge to all of us, I suppose, to say, if you cling to your influence and your power, whatever that is, that's not what leadership, that's not what true leadership looks like if it's in the service of the common good. And he contrasted that with the way that Queen Elizabeth has, has led her life. That was a, an opportunity grasped, I thought, at that moment. I, I thought the other thing that really struck me about today, again, not particularly surprising, but just when we moved away from the Mall and all those people, and they didn't quite, it seemed to me, didn't quite know what to do. They wanted, you know, they wanted to show their respects, but, it's just that slight bubbling up of joy. And that's, I guess, the other point that, of course, this has been a very solemn and sad and extremely beautifully wrought occasion. But she did bring a great deal of joy to a great many people. I mean, if you, if you, if you write one legacy, I mean, Jamie, you saw her over many years. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I think there was a feeling, certainly I had a feeling, um, watching those pictures and actually watching the, the, um, Her Majesty's Coffin in the, in the Abbey, you know, just undeserved good luck that we had having this amazing person um, as, our, as our head of state and head of nation and, and, and indeed head of this, head of this family. It was, we, we were just phenomenally lucky. Yeah, but you know that um, Churchill, even in 1955, when he finally resigned, wrote and said, I, I soon realised that you were going to serve as well as rule and therefore rule by serving. Yeah, and I think that was perhaps something the Archbishop was yeah. said it in a different mm. way. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's a reminder there that uh, we really are witnessing the end of a remarkable chapter when we're talking about both Elizabeth II and Winston Churchill in the same sentence. Now, what we have witnessed and felt to will live long in the memory, as we've just been discussing. That will be as true for those reporting on what they've seen and experienced as anyone. Let's then hear first from our colleague, Mary Nightingale, who was at Westminster Abbey for this morning's funeral service there, Mary. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I, I was there from the very early hours of this morning. I think all of us were expecting a remarkable day. I don't think any of us could have anticipated the sheer spectacle, the magnificence of the ceremonial that we witnessed. I was there from the very early hours and I saw the build-up, I saw the military, I saw all the armed forces lining the streets, getting into position, the precision of it, the sheer choreography of it, the way it was so beautifully organised. I personally was looking forward to the Pipers, the Irish and Scots Pipers. We knew that there would be 200 of them preceding the coffin and they were, as I anticipated, 
magnificent. The sheer noise of that many pipers together, it makes your skeleton shake. It makes your bones vibrate. It is beyond description. So that for me was a high point and they kept a perfect step right outside the abbey there. And it was one of those times, you know, where you feel very, very lucky to do your job. I had a seat overlooking history and I did feel very, very fortunate. It was a huge occasion for our nation, but we were also being watched by the rest of the world and we had a huge number of dignitaries who flew into London for this occasion. They said it was the equivalent of a hundred state visits all at the same time. So the security challenges were, again, very, very large and it seemed to go off beautifully. We can see Joe Biden, the US president and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden. Now, quite a lot of the dignitaries were bussed in, but they came in the beast, which is their, but their, uh, armoured car that they use in their motorcade. There you can see Emmanuel Macron, uh, the President of France, and his wife, Liz Truss, our new Prime Minister, and her husband being led into the Abbey. And she, of course, read a lesson today, quite a week, for her. Mr Trudeau there, you can see very many dignitaries were in London today, and I think London did them proud. It was a remarkable, remarkable spectacle that they were there to see. Now, I remember the Queen once saying, Her Late Majesty the Queen, saying that you can do anything if you're properly trained. She said, this job is all down to training, and I think we saw the most wonderful demonstration of that today with Prince George and Princess Charlotte, aged nine and seven, respectively. Now they behaved in a way I think way beyond their years, walking behind the coffin of their grandmother and their great-grandmother I should say and not putting a step wrong behind their parents or in front of their parents I should say, they were behind the Earl of Wessex there, but they behaved absolutely beautifully and I think anyone, any parents of nine and seven year olds would have been astonished to think that theirs could behave quite so well. It must have been a very long day for them, but they sat through it. They clearly treasured being part of it. And they seemed to drink in every single moment. Magnificent aerial view of the abbey there. The nave stretching from west to east and the coffin in the middle the cross of the Abbey that you can see. It was um, an extraordinary day. I'll never forget it. And I don't think anyone who is watching today will do either. Larry, thank you. Well, once the state funeral ended, the Queen's final journey to Windsor began, of course. Our royal editor, Chris Ship has witnessed the procession as the cortege passed Buckingham Palace and saw the tens of thousands of people who turned out to say a final goodbye. Your reflection on what you've witnessed, Chris? Well, Julie, I've witnessed over the last 10 or 11 days a number of the different elements of this Queen's final journey. If you remember, King Charles said on the, uh, in that address that he gave on the day after his mother's death, he called it the last great journey. Uh, and two of those uh, elements were today. I was standing at the, the bottom of the Mall at the Queen Victoria uh, Memorial. It's difficult to explain the length of that procession that escorted the Queen out of her capital city for the final time. From the very start of it, where you had the uh, mounted police from the Metropolitan Police, and then you had the Canadian Mounties, the Royal Mounted Police, uh, all the way from Canada, uh, all the way to the end. It, it, you know, it stretched for a good 40 minutes or so, and um, it was slow, it was methodical, it was somber. But I noticed a, a difference with, with, with the crowd today because I stood at the, a very similar spot when the Queen's uh, coffin went to the lying in state and there was lots of cheering, there was lots of clapping. I think people really did feel today an element of finality. This was uh, a final goodbye. And for me, uh, I think when the coffin uh, with the King and his siblings and uh, the Queen's grandchildren behind, when it went past Buckingham Palace for the very final time, remember we're talking here about 
her home, her office, uh, the place she spent so many, much of her time over the last uh, 70 years. Uh, it went past uh, Buckingham Palace again very slowly uh, for the final time today and that really struck me as quite uh, a moment. So I think we're used to a nation of seeing the Queen there standing on that very balcony in the centre of the screen, uh, a moment of national celebration, uh, trooping the colour most recently. I remember being at that very spot for the Jubilee celebrations. How very different it all felt today, the reason why these crowds were uh, in London. And I suppose we should also remark just before we see the, the gun carriage there, go up Constitution Hill and pass Buckingham Palace for the very final time. Uh, we should remark on that journey the state hearse took from Wellington, um, Wellington Arch to Windsor. Uh, where again, uh, we, we've seen this in Scotland, we've seen it in L London now uh, twice, uh, where people instinctively just wanted to uh, come out of their homes and to see the state hearse travel on that what was nearly a two-hour journey from Wellington Arch all the way to Windsor and a route that didn't take her along the M4, a route that took the Queen through roads where the maximum number of people uh, could see her. and. I was struck by the moment it arrived in Windsor and there were flowers that had ended up on the windscreen, on the roof, on the bonnet of that state hearse. Remember, this is a hearse that the Queen herself uh, took some uh, interest in the design. She wanted people to be able to see her in death as they saw her uh, in life. And that procession there, look at the long walk, look at the number of people. When I arrived in Windsor uh, this evening, Tom and Julie, uh, they were announcing over the loudspeakers that the long walk was closed. They simply couldn't get any more people uh, on it. So, um, you know, this was the final journey all the way from there to that service. We've just been watching the committal service in St George's Chapel. Okay, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Well, as Chris was just saying, some of the most beautiful, some of the most arresting uh, images of the day, certainly some of the most majestic, uh, was that procession making its way along the long walk in the midst of those crowds. And Nina uh, is there waiting with some of the people. Yeah, how, how do you begin to describe the indescribable, really, a moment in time when given the very nature of the long walk, it afforded so very many people such an intimate vantage point. Uh, I think those around me described uh, the first moment that really got to them was the sound of the bagpipes filling the avenue here with the skyboat song. Then, as the Queen's coffin, as the Queen's hearse first came into view, absolute silence. Then, a flutter of applause, a dignified, sombre moment marking the magnitude of what they were witnessing here on the Long Walk. Some people arrived here yesterday afternoon and stayed through the night to, to get the, the point closest to the castle to, to see the funeral procession pass through the gates. I'm joined now by some of them. One is the uh, artist Charles Minty. Charles, you painted through the night and then you paused as the funeral procession went through. Were you surprised by your reaction? Um, yes, well, it, I uh, felt very emotional during the church service with the beautiful singing. Um, but actually when the Queen went past, I thought the services did a tremendous job and uh, I think Her, Maj Her Majesty would have been really proud, especially of the horses, which seemed to uh, cope with the crowds really well. So, so I thought it was a great job and uh, yeah, really proud of, of everybody that came here today and everyone that, that's conducted the ceremony. It was a fantastic occasion. You were named by your parents after King Charles III. Well, yes, uh, I was born on the day that uh, Charles and Diana were married, uh, which was 29th of July, 81, um, which makes me 41. And, um, yeah, so, so he's my namesake. Uh, I'm named after King Charles, uh, which is a, a great thing. And the painting began at uh, Bath Abbey, uh, uh, where one of the books of condolences was opened and has been finished here today. Charles, thank you. Well, uh, also watching the procession, also here overnight, was Alicia and her family. Um, you shed a tear when you saw the Queen's hearse. I did. It was really, really emotional. Um, I just felt 
flooded by the grandeur of it all and I got choked up and I didn't expect to get choked up at all but it was just so regal and royal in every sense of the word and I was happy that I got to experience it with my son and my husband. So Akio, you wanted to be here, are you glad you came? Yes, I am and when, when the when I saw the Queen, I was surprised she died very quickly when I didn't expect it. And, I, and, and when I was upstairs going to bed, I shed a little tear. Oh, Akio. And, and Father Leon, you're from France. What, what did our Queen mean to you? Her Majesty, the Queen Elizabeth, represented uh, stability and uh, she was a great ambassador for the United Kingdom across the world. Uh, may she rest in perfect peace. You uh, were joined uh, throughout the night and throughout the day uh, by a new friend, uh, Marion and her family. Marion, um, you have come to Windsor after being the 14th person to witness the Queen's lying in state in Westminster Hall. Why did you decide after doing that that Windsor was the place you wanted to come to for the Queen's funeral? First, we want to go, we plan to go to London, and then I see the news, they said there's a lot of people there, so we changed our plan to come in Windsor instead. And uh, the reason why I'm be here, I would like to take my family, my niece from North Wales, uh, Wrexham, uh, to come to see uh, last say goodbye to Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth yeah, the second, yeah. second. And what was it like for you when the funeral procession made its journey past you? Oh, I cannot describe. It was so like so emotional, and for me, I pray for her. Yeah, I pray for her to go to heaven. Yeah, and thank you very much. You know, for for her to be here for us and do all these thing to us and I would like my children to know the new generation people to know to learn respect a, a loyal family you know they, they need to know you know uh, how important that they're gonna be here I would like to support uh, King Charles the first yeah I want to tell him that we are here for him yeah I think he's very much seen that with the, the thousands that turned out today Rosie what was the moment like for you it's just nice to be here to pay respects to Her Majesty for a thank you for 70 years of service. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank, thank you for you. joining me uh, this afternoon. Uh, the Long Walk was created by Charles II. It has seen many a chapter in royal history, perhaps in our lifetimes. This is the biggest of them all as Charles III's chapter now really begins. Nina, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, for some final reflections on the emotions and the history of today, we're joined again by Anna Whitelock, as well as Sir Trevor MacDonald and Jonathan Dimbleby, all with us here in our Windsor studio. What a gathering indeed. And Sir Trevor, of course, welcome home to us. It's such a joy to share a few moments of reflection with you, flooded with grandeur, one of uh, the uh, women that Nina was speaking to commented a day of such huge symbolism. Um, and I think, you know, as our co colleagues have been saying, no one can doubt that this represents the, the passing of an era. There's absolutely no question about it. And, and what, you know, the impressions that one will keep about it is, are, are, are that, you know, those crowds on the, on the long walk uh, uh, you know, you'd never seen so many people. And the general reaction of people all along the way to Windsor, um, the roads were lined with, with crowds. We never thought that we'd see anything like it. And, uh, it, uh, you know, an a one age has passed, another begins, but the, the symbolism is absolutely profound and it would be very real to people. Can I just ask you to put it in perspective? Lots of people watching this programme will remember you covering the release of Nelson Mandela, the fall of the Berlin Wall, first interview with Nelson Mandela after he was released. These are sort of epoch-making moments. Where does this fit, do you think, in all the things you've seen? Around? Nothing quite like this. Um, you know, you, you're very kind to remember some of the, the things that we witnessed before, but this has outstripped everything. Um, and I think it, it, it represents, it shows that um, 
you know, the, the Queen did have a, a, a was represented, but you know, who but by somebody who was really a, a, a pulled to the world. Everybody talked about her. People understood what she was all about, and she did. She reciprocated that. The relationship with the Commonwealth, quite extraordinary. She was uh, knowledgeable about the, the, the countries they represented. Um, they really had a great, great affection for her. One prime minister said to me once at, at a very controversial prime minister's meeting in, in Southern Africa, he says, I said, you know, what, what does she do? Does she make a grand speech here? Does she encourage the people who were at the conference? No, no, no. Just by being here, she makes the conference a success. So, you, you know, there can be no doubt about what we saw here, t we saw here today. I, King, King Charles has been quoting Shakespeare in, in some of his speeches, uh, remembering his mother. Other poets have had, you know, other things to say uh, about it. I remember p particularly, um, you know, and in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our despair and almost against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And I think that is what families, uh, certainly the royal family, will remember about today. Jonathan, biographer, of course, of the new king. Your assessment and reflections on what we've witnessed unfold? I feel simply wrung out, <laughs> overwhelmed by this astonishing day, which I'd foreseen but had no idea quite how powerful it would be. The, 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 the relentless, irrevocable path of the hearse up the long walk, the flowers strewn on either side, and the huge crowds, and the wonderful, bleak simplicity of the committal service, which so many people we know the words of, and you thought then at that point of the family there who were sitting there seeing their mother, their grandmother, great grandmother, be slowly disappearing into the vaults. And I found that totally overwhelming. And I, I think like lots of people, I guess, my heart went out to that family. And at the same time, I thought of the new king, our king, and thought I hope he has the I think he has the courage, the strength, and I hope he has the good health to be the very good king that I believe he is and will be. We talked a little earlier, and I think everyone watching this will have seen the sorrow in his eyes, completely yes. understandable. He obviously had, in one sense, two relationships with his mother, one as a son and one as a, you know, Absolutely. an heir. Do you think often what we're afflicted by when a parent dies, I think, is... I wish I'd said this, I wish I'd said that. Is there anything he would have wished he'd said, do you think, or do you think it I, was... I all? can't think of any particular thing. I think all children are likely to feel that. I certainly have felt that, both in respect of my father and my mother, and uh, I don't doubt that he does feel that. But we saw in his... the card on the coffin, it summed up everything that strong love that he had for her. It was, it was difficult when they were young. He, she was away a great deal. It was his grandmother who he turned to for support. But over the years, he's not only revered her, absolutely revered her, certainly did not wish to say, I'm looking forward to the day when I can be king, knew that it was going to be his duty, learnt from her, imbibed from her the sense of responsibility that he is actually born so powerfully and so well. You look at that family now, the pain on their faces and the, now the public duty inside there in the, in the, in the abbey. In the, and you, you think that combination that the king has to have of being the human being that he is, warm, generous, loving and kind, but also being the head of state, representing this nation at home, to its people and to the world. And you think, Godspeed. 
Just on these images, Anna, um, to reflect, there's another image of the day. They come, they come so regularly, don't they, uh, with the young Prince George. But the image of the imperial state crown, its progression throughout the day, its historical momentum that we've witnessed, especially within this last hour. What are your observations there? Yeah, I mean, you've summed that up beautifully. I mean, my eyes throughout the day were on that imperial crown because I knew inevitably there was going to be a moment of parting where the imperial crown, the orb and the scepter would be lifted off the coffin, denoting that the late Queen's body became mortal once more. And in a sense, it was a moment of de-investiture. Um, the instruments of state were placed on the altar, ready for her body to be lowered. Uh, into the vault as the new king looked on, knowing that it would be his head upon which the crown would next be set um, after the coronation. And I mean, it was a great honor to be observing it with these two gentlemen, these events today. Um, and amid all that, I guess there was also just something, I mean, so profound that moment with the crown. But also as I was watching the coffin arrive in Windsor, there was a sort of sense of the sound of Scotland blowing in with these, the, the, the band and the pipes. And I just had a sense of, you know, she grew up having been here, you know, performing pantomimes with her children. She became, with her sister rather, she, she became queen, she traveled the world and she came home. And there was just a real sense uh, relentlessly in that long walk procession of her coming home. And then of course that, image of uh, the corgis waiting for her. I think any kind of hard-nosed historian like me, that was, that was it. So uh, for me, that was a really profound, magical image actually, alongside the more profound one, I suppose, of um, yes, the, the crown being lifted from the coffin. I guess if anyone wasn't gonna be surprised by what we saw today, it should be a royal historian, dare I say. Were you surprised by anything? And if so, what and why? I was surprised a little bit by my reaction because I've been thinking and writing about this for such a long time and the fact that, you know, the late Queen did have this mystique, this kind of magic that still was so potent and visible today and whether it be, you know, heads of state from around the world or just the crowds that came out to gather, all ages, you know, faiths or whatever, they were there t t needing to, to witness the moment. And, yeah, this sense of succession and continuity in the lifting of the crown off the coffin and placed on the altar ready for the coronation, but also a sense of, you know, the smooth succession, but it was a wrench. And I think after 70 years, um, there is this moment of just the wrenching of the crown from the coffin. I just found that really quite profound. And Trevor, for those... Um, who have been fortunate enough to meet her, and that, of course, includes you. There have been deep moments of personal reflection and memory. Just uh, tell us a bit about... You, you, couldn't, you, could, you couldn't escape it. And watching the ceremony, you thought back about the times that you had some sort of interaction with her. And um, she was always somebody who was extremely always accessible. You know, she... Um, didn't just pretend to be interested, she was interested. And you saw it particularly when she um, met the various prime ministers from the Commonwealth. I remember in one, case, in one occasion at the Bahamas, she, she was talking to um, her husband, Prince Philip, and said, do you know the Maroonies, they brought the children here today. And, and that was so nice. There was a party on the royal yacht. And, um, and she, she, she talked to the... the, the um, she said, Benazir Bhutto is here. You must, you, you must say hello to her. And she always had that ability to make people feel at ease in the most extraordinary circumstances when great issues were at stake. And yet there was a profound humanity about her which never, never left her. And that was... And people saw that. And, um, you know, it was very nice when uh, um, I had the chance. I showed her around ITN once and um, <laughs> um, tried and failed to <laughs> explain to her some of the technical aspects <laughs> of, of the television world. But she, Good heavens, she, they left that to you, Trevor. She, <laughs> <laughs> but she, she found it all very, very amusing. And, and, and 
for all I, I know, she was, um, you know, terribly, terribly interested. One always got that feeling about, about being in the company of Her Majesty. And um, I agree with something that Jonathan said, you know, we would never, ever forget today that image of the coffin being lowered into the vault. And we, represent, we remembered then that there were two ceremonies here, one for the nation and the world, but one also for the family. And uh, the grief was quite marked on their faces. And, uh, you know, those two things, the huge symbolism of it all, made this quite remarkable, quite remarkable day. Jonathan, in one sense, you've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about the impact of this dad. You, you obviously can't write about a man you know is going to be king with, without that being front and center. Were there things about it, nevertheless, despite all that, that surprised you? And if so, what were they? Not so much surprised, but impressed. I did not know, because I don't follow in detail protocol of a funeral, never have done. And I did know something about what this was going to be, but the sustained demand made on him. Mm. I've seen him being resilient. I've seen him in bad times, personal times. I've seen him in good times. I've seen him in public roles. I've seen him one to one. I've seen him in a great many places from a long time ago, as you can see. And the 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 and and I learnt to have an enormous respect for him, and I acquired a deep affection for him. And. I knew this would be very, very testing. You come out of a situation which you never wanted, the death of your mother, you acquire immense responsibility. Of course, he'd had practice for it because he was doing more and more of her public duties in the, in the final years. And he'd also made a huge number of his own visits abroad. As we know, he has very strong views on a number of issues which happen to be views that are now overwhelmingly shared by the great majority of people here and around the world. But that doesn't, I think, equip you for the moment that you have to be the king. And he's thought about it very carefully. He knows what it requires him to do. But I thought that he carried it through so brilliantly, so difficult to be the head of the family, grieving for his beloved mother, and at the same time representing this country already to the world. So, Trevor, I mean, whether we like it or not, and we've talked about it quite a lot today, this is the closing of a chapter. It's kind of remarkable how, even though we've had 10 days of preparation, it still seems a, a bit of a shock to, to get to the end. I think many people probably feel that. We, we do have a new king. We saw him in St George's Chapel as they sang, God Save the King. What do you think he needs to do, if anything, in the next, you know, year? I think he needs to continue on the path that, that he's chosen. I mean, he understands that he cannot be as activist as he has been on some issues. Although um, it is very interesting to note that long before certain issues that we talk about today, you know, the future of the planet, the environment. Um, he talked about these things long before it became part of the international conversation. So I think we would be very comforted knowing that we have, as a monarch, uh, um, someone who has made these issues part of his own life and he's promoted these issues. And that'll be a, a great, great comfort. And I saw him once um, when we were doing some programs ab about Prince Charles, as he was then. And he said, you know, what people don't understand is that I have a profound love for this country, and I will always do my best. And I think he will. And he's had a long, as we've been talking about, he's had a long apprenticeship. Uh, um, and he, he, he knows what the job is uh, involved. Um, his, his mother, the, the, the Queen, um, was so zealous in her work that she gave him very little to do. But he has observed it all, and um, I think he will make an excellent monarch. And we've discussed journeys endlessly, haven't we, uh, Anna? Uh, we should remark on the new king's progress through this land that we've witnessed in these last few days, taking in the entirety of the country. We've seen urban centres and rural 
landscapes throughout this week, not only with the Queen's progress, but the new King's? Absolutely. I mean, there has been this sort of dual royal progress, the royal progress of the late Queen, but also the royal progress of the new King going quite deliberately to all of the nations, as you say, crossing the country, crisscrossing the country, realising that, you know, as his mother said, he needed to be seen to be believed. He needed to reaffirm the bond uh, with the people. And as we referenced earlier, that actually a kind of instinctive um, warmth, reaching out to the crowd as they reached out to him, a different kind of royal touch. As a historian, I've thought a lot about the sort of royal touch, the revered royal touch, but perhaps in this new age of monarchy, it's much more of a touchy royal touch, a, a, a touch that's accepting, affectionate. Um, and I think, you know, Charles having, I think in the past been seen to be somewhat reserved, just struck on that image, actually, um, really haunting image, um, having the uh, orb, crown and scepter removed from the, the Queen's coffin and there, Charles looking on. Well, and, uh, He's saying goodbye. The colour, camp colour of the Queen's company, 1st Battalion, the Grenadier Guards. And of course, the image of the Queen, our oh, ceremonial breaking of the wand, a centuries old custom with the senior members of the Royal House, I would have done that, and here the Lord Chamberlain did it. And that buried with the Queen, signalling the end. It's such a finality there, I think. Well, that's Andrew Parker just walking off behind the new king there, the Lord Chamberlain, as we we're discussing um, ending his term in office. He's only been in office a short period of time, um, moving into the Lord Chamberlain's role uh, just before, obviously, the Queen died, and we wait to see how that progresses. Um, it has been quite some day. It's been a very great privilege and a pleasure to hear from Jonathan, Sir Trevor and Anna. So thank you very much indeed for sparing the time to be with us. Well, before we end, let's return to Chris, who's covered almost every moment of this extraordinary 10 days of mourning. Your final thoughts, Chris, after our final goodbye to the Queen. Well, Julia, I think most people will agree it does feel like it's been a very long goodbye from the place of death in Balmoral to the place of her final resting point here uh, in Windsor. But I think um, there was an element of finality to everything today. But just as there was a reminder of the uh, reality of what happened, I think also we're reminded of the constancy of monarchy. That's what it's designed to do. Uh, the Queen has departed, but we were presented today with an image, of course, of the new king and the two kings who will, of course, uh, follow him. And I'm reminded of that uh, moment when the instruments of state, the emblems of majesty, were removed from the Queen's coffin and placed uh, on the altar uh, from where they came in uh, 1953 for her coronation. And they will, in turn, be passed to uh, the new king. So I think uh, for, for everyone who's uh, been watching there are so many images to take in but I will say just on one sort of human point at the very end of all this Julie I think everyone in the country will feel very proud of that bearer party from the 1st Battalion the Grenadier Guards for what they did today. Amen to that Chris thank you very much uh, a duty fulfilled indeed thank you. And that is where our programme on the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II draws to a close here at Windsor, the ceremonies have been both soothing yet electrifying, extraordinary yet familiar, ethereal yet somehow visceral too. For 70 of her 96 years, she embodied the magic of majesty. She was the face and figurehead of our country, the queen of queens for our time and all time. A life like no other has been mourned these past 12 days. Well, now her coffin and Prince Philip's will be placed together close to both her parents. It was while unveiling a statue to her father, George VI, that Her Majesty the Queen spoke those unusually personal words. He shirked no task, however difficult, and to the end, he never faltered in his duty to his people. 
she could, of course, have been talking about herself. Good evening. Good evening. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. To my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this. Thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May Flights of angels, sing thee to thy rest. Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, attended uh, the funeral today. There were no major events here in Wales, uh, no big screens. It has been a day of quiet solitude. People watching the events in a pub that we were at uh, earlier on the outskirts of Abba Van, people in their homes just taking their time to reflect. But in places uh, like Abba Van, where there is a strong link to the Queen, many have come down here to remember the lost ones, uh, those that, the loved ones they lost, and indeed Her Majesty. 
Dan Whitehead, thanks very much. Well, our oil correspondent, Laura Bundock, is, is still here with us. And, and Laura, one of the things that struck me about today after being in Buckingham Palace and seeing the flowers in Green Park and coming down here and seeing the long walk again are the, are the flowers around Windsor Castle and the way that they have been arranged and the fact that it carpets around the castle, it skirts the castle, it skirts the Royal Mile. It is a beautiful element of, of, of people being involved in this service, isn't it? I think people, despite being told perhaps don't bring the flowers, wanted to leave something wanted to leave a message and we've seen them laid here outside St George's Chapel and it's quite a sight they're all laid in the same direction all neatly all neatly bunched together you can see so many sunflowers there as well and the smell of those flowers hits you too and we've seen them laid outside Cambridge Gate at the end of the long walk and indeed all around the edge of the castle this morning people have been coming and bringing more it really is quite a sight here it is lovely and it's something that certainly is striking when you first come here. Laura, thanks very much. We're going to be hearing more from Laura in a short while. Um, but let's just leave you with some of the images that have collected throughout the day here. It's six o'clock. This is Sky News live from Windsor Castle. As the nation bids farewell to its longest serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. King Charles led senior members of the royal family as they formed a solemn procession as the Queen's coffin was taken to Westminster Abbey. <laughs> Prince George and Princess Charlotte were the youngest mourners in a congregation full of world leaders. Thousands of members of the armed forces from the UK and abroad have taken part in one of the grandest ceremonial events in living memory. The Queen's coffin was draped in the royal standard with the wreath of flowers requested by the King. Tens of thousands of mourners lined the procession route from the Abbey to Wellington Arch where the Queen's coffin was driven to Windsor. Crowds fell silent as the state hearse carrying the Queen's coffin slowly processed down the long walk towards the castle. The royal family gathered inside St George's Chapel for a service of committal for the Queen. And later this evening, the Queen will be reunited with the Duke of Edinburgh in a private burial in the chapel. Hello, good evening. We're live at Windsor Castle as the nation and the world says farewell to Britain's longest serving monarch. Thousands of people lined the long walk here in Windsor as the coffin was brought to St George's Chapel for a service of committal. And at 7.30 this evening, members of the royal family will gather for a private internment of Queen Elizabeth. But it was much earlier in the day that proceedings began, with the king leading a procession behind the late monarch's coffin on a gun carriage to Westminster Abbey for a state funeral. The Archbishop of Canterbury told the congregation the queen was joyful, present, touching a multitude of lives. Well, the service at Westminster Abbey was attended by around 2,000 people, including members of royal families from across Europe and politicians from around the world.
World leaders in attendance included the French President Emmanuel Macron alongside his wife Brigitte. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, and the First Lady, Jill Biden, joined mourners. The Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, was among the Commonwealth leaders in Westminster. And among the last to arrive were the leaders of the home nations, First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, and First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Former Prime Ministers, Sir John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson arrived next. The current Prime Minister Liz Truss then entered the Abbey with her husband, Hugh O'Leary. Four senior members of the royal family made their way into Westminster Abbey. Led by the Queen Consort Camilla and the Princess of Wales, along with Prince George and Princess Charlotte. Well, once all the guests were inside the Abbey, the Queen's coffin was brought from the Palace of Westminster. At the King's request, the wreath on top of the coffin contained foliage of rosemary, English oak and myrtle, and flowers in shades of gold, pink and deep burgundy, with touches of white, all cut from gardens of royal residences. The coffin was lifted and carried in procession to the state gun carriage of the Royal Navy. Around 6,000 representatives from all three armed services were involved in the procession, with 98 Royal Navy sailors pulling the 123-year-old gun carriage. It followed the traditional set at the funeral of Queen Victoria in 1901. 200 musicians formed the procession, led by pipes and drums of Scottish and Irish regiments, the Brigade of Gurkhas and the Royal Air Force. Much of the music was selected. Much of the music was selected for its special significance to Queen Elizabeth. At the Abbey, the King and the Queen Consort walked immediately behind the coffin, followed by the Princess Royal and her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, the Duke of York, the Earl and Countess of Wessex, and the Prince and Princess of Wales. Prince George and Princess Charlotte walked with their parents, followed by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and other members of the royal family. The Archbishop of Canterbury gave the sermon and praised the Queen's selfless service. She was joyful, present to so many, touching a multitude of lives. 
And we pray today especially for all her family, grieving as every family at a funeral, including so many families around the world who have themselves lost someone recently. But in this family's case, doing so in the brightest spotlight. May God heal their sorrow. May the gap left in their lives be marked with memories of joy and life. Her late majesty's broadcast during COVID lockdown ended with, we will meet again. Words of hope from a song of Vera Lynn. Christian hope means certain expectation of something not yet seen. Well, towards the end of the ceremony, the last post was played by the state trumpeters of the Household Cavalry. then sang the national anthem.